Well, good morning, everybody. Super glad that you were all able to come and be with us today. Um, we're actually going to begin with some military honors, and so if you all would, would you please uh, stand with me?
those of you who've never experienced or been a part of um, a special ceremony like this, um, this is just a, 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 our way to pay tribute to the service that Bill offered to this country years ago. Um, so for the color guard, thank you for coming out. Um, but let's go ahead and just have a quick seat. And um, I just want to welcome you all. I don't want I don't want the somberness of that ceremony to overwhelm today because Bill uh, Bill was not a somber guy. And so we want to transition our hearts a little bit towards the, the laughter, the fun, the celebration of who he is. So, um, but before we do, if you guys wouldn't mind, let's go ahead and just pray. So Heavenly Father, Lord, I want to thank you for bringing us all together, um, God, that we could just be united in the, in the one truth that, that we all love, Bill. God, for the family that traveled to come in, the friends that are all here. We just thank you for giving us this space, this opportunity to, to lift him up. God, we just thank you. We're here for you. We're here to honor you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Um, Bill, as you know, it's, he served in this church for a long time, and one of the things he did was he always greeted at that door underneath that exit sign, actually, and that was kind of his post. And he was there, I mean, every weekend. And, and when worship would start, he would sneak in through these doors and he would kind of stand in that back corner. Sometimes he'd pull a chair up if he was feeling pretty tired that day. Um, but he would always participate in worship. And one of the things we're going to do is we're going to we're going to participate just like he did. Um, so, Simon, if you would, let's go ahead. We're going to get Amazing Grace uh, going. And feel free to sing along. This is just a chance for us to posture our hearts to God and, and do like Bill did. And we're going we're gonna to worship together. So, Simon, if you would.
Page 86 of Prescott, Arizona, peacefully went home to heaven and was reunited once again with his beloved wife, Carla Mary, on November 25th, 2023. Bill was born to parents Don and Lone Good on October 22nd, 1937 in Salem, Oregon. Bill graduated from Eugene High School and then went on to earn his bachelor's degree in pre-law from the University of Oregon. And after graduation, Bill enlisted the United States Army where he proudly served his country for the next eight years in the capacity both in, the, in active duty and then he enlisted and became a reservist. Um, during his first marriage to Sharon, Bill became the father of two beautiful sons, David Nathan and Michael Lynn. Bill's work at the time provided his young family with a unique and special opportunity to both live and travel in different parts of Europe. Bill was known for his love of computers. He began his life's love of computers as a data entry programmer in the 60s. Bill also loved animals, especially his beloved German shepherd dog named Christmas, or some would just plain call her Chris. In 1981, Bill married Carla Mary, the love of his life, along with her two sons, Anthony John and Michael Joseph. They were married for 30 Five years until Carla went home to heaven in 2016. Bill loved and remained very devoted to his family. Bill deeply loved our Savior Jesus Christ, starting his life-changing journey as a devoted follower of Christ during his marriage with Carla Mary. After Carla Mary's passing, Bill made regular donations towards cancer research. Bill also gave generously to his home away from home, Heights Church. He also served for several years as one of their much-loved and devoted volunteers, dedicating much of his time here. Here at Heights, everyone knew Bill as that kind man with the most infectious, bright, and beautiful smile, who welcomed all who entered the church with his signature wave, followed by his big smile and a bit of humor. You couldn't have asked for a better ambassador, as his love for all people was evident. Bill's deep faith and his growth in his relationship with Jesus remained steadfast and strong up until his passing. Bill is survived by the following family. His brother, David Good. Sons, David Good, Michael Good, and Michael Williams. Nephews, Edmund Good, and Andrew Good. Niece, Dee Dee Ann Howard. Grandchildren, Paige, Logan, Nicholas, Caitlin, Sean, Curtis, Hunter, Margaret, and Carly. Um, if you guys would, let's go ahead and just stand up. We're going to get our blood flowing a little bit. We've got one more worship song. Um, this is an opportunity for us to not be embarrassed. If you are one of the people, if you're like me, where there's not a chance in the world you're going to get caught singing in public because I can't hold a tune, I can't do anything re musically related this is not the time to worry about that. This is the time to just lift our hearts to God and to just celebrate, and, and we're just going to worship him. So, um, Simon, if you wouldn't mind, let's get that. Let's get that up. I've searched the world but it couldn't fill me Man's empty praise And treasures of faith Are never enough And you came along and Put me back together And every desire now satisfied here in your love oh there's nothing better than you there's nothing better than you lord there's nothing nothing is better No 
The God of the mountain is the God of the valley, and there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing So go ahead and head on up. Um, there's some stairs over there. Um, and just for you guys to know, this is, it's okay to laugh. It's okay to be silly. And we can make fun of Bill. If he was here, we'd be making fun of him a little bit, right? Just like a little bit. So it's okay to kind of let your guard down and just enjoy the moment. Um, enjoy the stories that we're going to hear. And in, in a little bit after we've had some of the family share, I'm going to open up if there's anybody maybe on serve team or a part of the church family that has had some experiences with Bill. Um, we'd love for you to have an opportunity to share some words as well. So, David, if you would, you want to head on up? Let me tell you. 
tell you, do not sit in front of those speakers. <laughs> he invited us to stand, and he knocked me down with the bass. <laughs> okay, I'm Dave Good. Uh, I'm Bill, Bill Good's brother, and uh, there's Mary Lee, uh, the middle child in our family. She was born in 37, excuse me, 35. I was born in 34. Yeah, I'm old. <laughs> the fact is, I talked to some of the legionnaires out front. They said, I noticed that you have USAF on your collar. He's a legionnaire, American Legion. And I said, uh, Army Air Corps? He said, no, no, Air Force. I said, OK. Uh, 1947 is when we changed the Army Air Force into the US Air Force. He said, I wasn't even born in 47. That made me feel kind of old. Let's see. Bill was born in Staten, uh, excuse me, Salem. I was born in Staten, Staten, Oregon. That's spelled O-R-E-G-U-N. You cut that down. Because you come from the East Coast, that's Oregon, and they don't never get it straight. Anyway, Staten is the string bing capital of the world. That's our claim to fame, I guess. During World War II, you know, the big one, Bill wasn't, uh, he went to San Diego with Mary Lee and my mom and dad, because dad was a Marine at station at Camp Pendleton, San Diego, California. I was a third wheel. If you know those particular days in the, in the 40s, apartments were definitely hard to find. And so you have a, a family of two kids, a third kid is the third wheel, it doesn't work. You won't find a place to sleep. So I stayed with my grandparents. Later Bill said, I felt sorry for you, David, that you didn't have a chance to live with your parents during the big war. And I said, you don't know, it was an honor to live, to live with my grandparents. I got to know my grandparents on both sides, my great-grandmother and her father, my great-great-grandfather. Genes long, long, run along in our family. He told me stories about the Civil War. He was born in Virginia, where I now live. Anyway, here are my glasses again. When uh, Dad deployed to the Pacific and fought in places like Guadalcanal. That was his first battle. He was with the 1st Marine Division. They were a combat heavy unit. Guadalcanal, Peleliu, Iwo Jima, Okinawa. And then in 46, I believe it was, we were reunited as a family in Salem, Oregon, the capital of Oregon. And Bill, before that, Dad was in the Marine Corps. He had earned lots of money playing poker. <laughs> he sent that money to Mom, and Mom needed it. He figured, I'm building up a nest egg. What he didn't realize was that my brother Bill had rheumatic fever. And he was bedridden for, oh gosh, three or four years. Missed some school, in fact, grade school. I just thought, he's lucky because he can lay at home in bed. I have to go to school. <laughs> Bill moved back, uh, let's see, he, he did like computers, that's true. He uh, worked for CDC, Computer Development Company, where the CDC, big computers like IBM mainframes, and that took him to all places in the world. And curiously, I was, my uncle sent me to all places in the world too. He's your uncle too, by the way. I was able to go to Europe and to Asia. That wasn't as pleasant as Europe. It was never pleasant when somebody's shooting at you. <laughs> In fact, as I told the wife, I have three allergies. Doctors, needles, and bullets. No response. I guess nobody's in combat here. <laughs> uh, Bill, uh, after he was done with his, he was an RFA, Reserve Forces Act. That's six months of active duty. 
and seven and a half years of reserve duty. And uh, he was pretty proud of that. I, on the other hand, I liked a good meal, and I, the mess hall gave me all kinds of good meals. So I stayed in the Army for a couple of years longer. Retired from there, in fact. Well, let's see. Bill moved all over. He, he was in London. His wife and my family visited David and Michael and Sharon in, in London, in Zurich, Switzerland. Uh, and then he came back. He said, served uh, working for CDC, did some mainframe work for the Department of Treasury in Culpeper, Virginia. So he visited us. So our family has visited one another quite often. Uh, later on, when I was stationed at Fort Huachuca, Arizona, that's down south of here for people who don't know Arizona. That's the reason that Bill came, by the way, to Arizona from California where he was located. He came here because he fell in love with Arizona's soil, as Nora does. And I think that's how you pronounce it. There's lots of Gila monsters out there. Let's see, later on, of course, he and, he, uh, he and my sister Marilee both divorced. Mary remarried Donald Don Howard and Bill married Mary Car, Car Carla Mary Williams and let's see he mar Bill married in in uh, California Mary in Vegas the marriage capital of the world I guess I attended Bill's marriage in Cal California where I met uh, Carla's sisters and her father Giovanni. We like to talk a little Italiano. <laughs> and her two sons, Tony Joseph, uh, Tony John, excuse me, and Michael Joseph. Um, Carla Christianized Bill. I say that because uh, earlier on, um, when he was married to Sharon, he was kind of, a, he was an interested, what I call an interested, interested Christian, but he became a committed Christian when he married Carla Mary. And you might ask, what's the difference between interested and, and committed? Well, uh, it's like the ham and egg breakfast. You see, uh, chicken is interested in what you have on your plate, but the pig, he's committed. Bill was a serious guy, very serious, at least he was when I was around him. And if I ever called him Billy, like I saw on that cup out front on the table, he would have punched me in the nose. He did not like Billy, but he got away, called her Mary, got away with it, I think. He had a very fast grin. In fact, the fast grin is kind of like, uh, are you familiar with Tombstone, Arizona? They have a quick draw contest in Tombstone. I went down there when I was stationed at Huachuca and I learned some of the some of the tricks of the trade. I learned I became probably the fastest draw in Arizona. You wanna see it? Let me demonstrate it. Wanna see it again? Hey, Bill, knowing your fondness of funny stories, I'll close this up with uh, the story about a mean guy by the name of Kyle. No offense. By the way, those are nice looking shoes. Are they 13s? Oh, too small. Anyway, it seems like Carl was a mean guy in town. No offense. He was a mean guy. Nobody liked him. When he died at his funeral, he did all the services up and then toward the, toward the middle part. He said, okay, if anyone has anything to say about mean Carl, now is the time to stand up and, and say what you want to say. 
and everybody raised their hand, and of course the pastor said real quick, like, remember, he's dead, so you don't say anything bad, you don't say anything about someone who's dead, you say nothing but nice things. So everybody went over, except one lady lowered their hands. He called her up, she came to the dais, and she just had a couple of words to say. She said, well, his brother was worse. Next, we're going to have one of Bill's sons, David, come up. So, David, if you're ready, the mic is yours. son and so basically that guarantees that I was the first one to make mistakes and I was the first one that he would have to be patient with um, I made a commitment to myself and him that I would keep this as short and to the point as I could because I, I want to hear what everybody else has to say a lot of these people are meeting you for the first time and you know you know my dad I, I knew him as dad I mean, every, a lot of people know him as Bill. I just know him as Dad. And I want to hear everybody else's take on, on the Dad that your side. So I'd rather do more listening than talking. But um, I want to keep this as, as, you know, from the heart as I can. <sighs> One of the favorite things that he liked about me, for sure, was that I was able to take everything I heard and condense it down short. So that's why I like to keep things simple. He, he thought it was smart. I, I just call it simplicity. Um, it is really hard to abbreviate 62 years down into a couple minutes, but that's what I'm going to try and do. Um, the first things that hit me when I, I, I prayed about this and, and we talked about it was is that his, his heart was as big as his work ethic was. And any of you who know him, whether it was serving here, standing by the back door, or if you were actually working a job with him, he, I mean, he went to the end. He went, he went as far as anyone would go. And, and I think that his heart was just as big. Even at, at his worst, he, he still tried that hard, even then. And um, I definitely don't ask, but I have the right to say that. So, um, I mean, a, a lot of you know him as the soft guy. He had the big smile, and he would come up, and, and he would try and hug you until you were unconscious. <laughs> Let, that's the dad that you all know. But when I grew up, he, he was that sometimes, but most of the time, don't ask me how, he had to be the enforcer. And uh, he was able to be just as strict and disciplined, and he had all the things that David just said he had. And um, so I got to see it all. But I can say at the worst, you know, the heart and the care and the love was always there, and that was before he was Christian. The difference that you saw here was because, you know, he embraced God and the living word, and we all know what that's about. So... Um, And I knew this as a kid, too, you know, like, even though we talked a lot later, um, we talked a lot later, basically, we were both in recovery. I, I'm recovering from a few things. He was recovering from a few things, and we had to make amends to each other, you know, because that's part of recovering. And so in the process, we went so far with it, it was like, well, what do we do now? I mean, now I guess we can just have fun now, right? Because there's nothing more to talk about. And then we both became Christian, and then we started, like, we would talk to each other, and it's like, well, all we want to talk about is Bible verses, because that's the only thing we're talking about, right? 
And then it became, we would talk and we would compare, he would compare the main message that was going on here at this church that Sunday. I play drums too, normally. I'm recovering from an accident. But, and then I would talk about the message that went on at the church that I played at in California. And every Sunday for five years, we would do that. And we would have a Bible study comparing the main verses of what we had heard in church that day. And um, when I was growing up, it wasn't that way. We didn't have that relationship. It was rough. But it ended up as happy as it could. And, you know, I knew this day would come. I mean, I've read about this day. I've heard about this day. But now I'm here. And um, I'm glad that it worked out this way. I can tell you that. bottom line is that you know to honestly I'm very content and this is like a celebration to me I never thought I would feel this way but I, I know he is where he is and I know he's with Carla I know he's with Tony and the words in this book have all proved themselves true he my at his worst he kept all his promises to me just because I didn't like some of the things the way they went whether I deserved them or not he kept his promises just like God has kept his, all his promises. So there's, there's no way that I can be sad right now. I, I can be disappointed that he's at the party and I'm still in boot camp. <laughs> you know, and I even took a chance of wearing his favorite jacket and wearing his favorite colors. Um, you know, he, he, at his worst, he was always a hero to me. He was then and he is now. So I guess at that point, it's almost rhetorical. We, we all agree on that part of it, I think, I hope. So I think I warned him. I did. We talked about this, you know, long before I knew he was sick, that, you know, when I come to your memorial, I'm going to ask this question, are you cool with it? You know, because I'm being less playful than I normally am. Normally, I, I, I'm more goofy than this. And we were together. Half of our conversations on the phone would be talking about Bible verses and then twisting him and then imagining what heaven was like and then I would twist it as far as I could go before he would call me out and it was a game it was fun and and now he's actually part of the story so what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask him the question I was going to ask him and I'm going to give a couple seconds of silence and I'm going to talk to him quietly the way I do now and so I want to thank you in advance. Thank you for letting me share. So, Dad, is heaven as glorious as we thought it was? Is it everything that we already knew it was? If you can't answer me, I understand. Okay, I'll see you when I see you. Thank you. from his first marriage and um, I want to make sure that I say right off the bat uh, thank you to Heights Church and Leah and uh, Pastor Kyle uh, my dad loved you guys so much so this is nice this is from my heart and uh, to help keep me on track it's on paper this came from my heart I remember a school event back in the second grade that was a really long time ago, but I remember it clearly. There was a big carnival fundraiser event, and my dad made an attraction as a contribution. It was a long, thick pine log, about eight feet long and about 12 inches in diameter. It was resting on two stands on either end, like specialized sawhorses. 
and it was suspended about three feet above the ground. There was soft padding and cushions beneath. Uh, the log itself was stripped of all its bark, uh, finely sanded, gloss finished, and wax polished. It was slippery as a wet stone covered in moss. The attraction was simply titled Joust. Two kids would climb on, one from each side. They were each given a big soft pillow. They would carefully inch their way across the log and meet each other in the middle. And this sometimes took many tries on this slippery log. Uh, when they finally got to the middle, they'd battle it out, try and knock each other off, which is windmilling away with those pillows. Uh, falling to the, to, the, to the padded ground below and just howling with laughter. I remember <laughs> how this attraction had the longest line at the carnival the whole time that day. It was wildly popular. And I remember <laughs> being so happy and proud that I had the dad responsible for this. And it made me feel like the coolest kid at the carnival. It really did. And I share this story with you because it tells something very important about my dad, in my opinion. He gave everything he did, his absolute best effort. And it always showed in the results. I've got so many examples of this. I have a lifetime of examples of this. You read his beautiful obituary. Pastor Kyle read his beautiful obituary. At the Heights, everyone knew Bill as the kind man with the most infectious, bright, and beautiful smile. It wouldn't have occurred to him to smile any other way. If we could hear him say it, I think he'd tell us something like, I'm going to smile, I'm going to mean it, and they're going to know it. My dad gave his absolute best effort at everything he did. And I do have tremendous respect for that. By the way, I'm the emotional one. Uh, I'm, I'm the fiery one. Uh, the temper can flare. Um, I can break out into happy tears. I'm that one. So... Pastor Kyle said, that's okay. All right, so I will tell you one story, and this will wrap it up. And I got to tell you about the greatest gift my dad ever gave me. When I was last here in Prescott with uh, my dad and family together, uh, we were one day paid a visit by Pastor Kyle. At one point in our conversation, Pastor Kyle asked me what had drawn me to my own journey with Jesus Christ. I thought about that for a good moment and told him it was my dad. Uh, I told him that I'd had people leaving clues and hints and spreading good and encouraging seeds at my feet my whole life, but that it was uh, my dad who really caught my attention. I'd like to share this with you. It's necessary that you understand my dad was a man of extraordinary determination, self-reliance, and confidence. Those are all good and admirable qualities. And I'm so happy that you told the story you did about an interested Christian. We're telling the same story here. I'm so, I was so happy to hear you say that. It's also important to understand this. Growing up as a kid, we went to church once per year on Easter Sunday. I came to realize somewhere in my early teens that Easter Sunday was the one day per year that my mom, Sharon, a lifelong and devoted follower of Christ Jesus, it was the one day per year that she could have her wish for all that Lord and church stuff. The Lord and church just weren't things that fit into my dad's life runs strictly on the guarantees of his own disciplined efforts and self-sufficiency. Many years went by. Lots of life happened, and my dad was a good, 
hardworking, determined, and self-reliant man through it all. And one day he met Carla Mary and fell in love. You read his beautiful obituary, or Pastor Kyle did. Bill deeply loved our Savior Jesus Christ, starting his life-changing journey during his marriage with Carla Mary. I remember the day I noticed my dad noticing Jesus Christ. It was in the mid-80s. Dad and Carla lived in Irvine at the time, and we were all in the car driving home from somewhere. Driving by a church, my dad casually pointed it out and told me it was the church that he and Carla Mary attended. And I thought, I thought I didn't hear him correctly. Um, I did. I said, I asked him, did you say the church you go to? And uh, he said, yes. Calm, matter of fact, nonchalant. Yes. I distinctly remember asking him, you mean church where Jesus Christ is the man? <laughs> Again, he answered casually, yes. Uh, I sat quietly. If you knew my dad, and, and you, you, if you knew my dad, you knew that uh, there's no point in arguing. It's just you, you can't win. Uh, and so I just sat there quietly, and the first thing I thought was, wow, he really, really is in love with Carla. That, that's what I thought. Like, he really loves her, because I know better. <laughs> I watched and followed his journey from a distance over the years. At a certain point, I realized it was for real, the most real thing that ever happened to him, and I started asking him questions. That was my beginning. My dad gave me my urge to find out more about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and thus began my own journey. That is the single greatest gift my dad ever gave me. I had the opportunity to tell him all this during that last visit in November, and he heard me. <laughs> you know, he wasn't talking much anymore, <laughs> but he heard me. He smiled. He heard me. So, thank you, Dad, and I pray for the courage, the strength, the resolve and the patience to help turn hearts like you helped turn mine. I love you. You know, I remember that conversation that we had back in November, and um, you gave this analogy that kind of summed it up, summed your dad up, right? You didn't, you didn't mention it. I thought you would. Because you mentioned it again when we were talking this morning, but I might, I, might, I might mess it up, but I think it went something like your dad was a steel hammer wrapped in a velvet glove. Is that an, an iron mallet in a velvet glove? That the, the truth was inescapable, but he was soft about it. It just kind of reminds me of Jesus, doesn't it? Um, I don't expect anybody to follow up with an incredible story from the 80s, <laughs> but if there's anybody that, is there anybody out there that has just a small story they would love to just come up and share that reminds you of Bill, something fun, something lighthearted, just, I know you, are you ready to come up? You just want to do it? All right, well, real quick, is there anybody else, real quick, this is, this is the chance, it doesn't have to be long, you, come on up, come on up, absolutely, and then you'll be up here shortly. I'm Bill's, I'm Paige Good, Bill's granddaughter. Um, I'm gonna keep this short, but I had the honor, he was at my wedding last year. Um, a lot of my coworkers got to meet him and I had several people describe him as the type of man who takes your hand to shake it and never lets it go. And there was a baby that he went to hold and I think he didn't give the baby back for two hours and the baby was just so happy and um, it's just everybody at my work was like, the, oh, the, the man with the big, beautiful smile and I said, yeah him so that, that's all yeah. 
All right, anybody else have anything fun to share? All right, we've got another one. Awesome. My name is Patty Hoffman, and Bill Bad is missing. <laughs> Our life group understands that. Um, uh, we've known uh, Bill for eight years and in our life group through Heights and he was introduced himself to Bill, my Bill and I as Bill Good and so my husband said well then that makes me Bill Bad so that was always our joke <laughs> anyway um, every, every other week we have life group and when we met Bill um, he had just lost Carla and he was just devastated. And I knew what he was going through because I had lost my first husband. And he and I spent many, many times together just, you know, thinking about heaven and what it's like for my deceased husband and his deceased wife. And we just got so close. And... Uh, so through those years, we ended up having life group at our home. Which we live also in Yavapai Hills. And um, he would stay longer. And uh, finally he said to my Bill, he said, I want to do a Bible study with just you. And, and he loved Andrew Womack, as many of you know. And he said, I've got one, Bill, that we're going to do together. And I said, okay, then I'll make supper. I'm from North Dakota. You make supper, not dinner. And and um, so every other Wednesday, when it wasn't life group, he'd come up, and we'd, we'd have supper. And, of course, all he could do, as you know, is just thank you and encourage you. And, oh, you guys had the greatest dad, just the greatest dad. We just loved him so much, and we miss him every other week in life group for sure but every day in our lives we think about Bill and he used to sit right right up here and praise God and have his arms up in the air and the first time my Bill and I watched um, church on online we're like there's Bill there's Bill we could tell his bald head and his hands were up and it was so cool but anyway um just so many good memories we all have and most of our life group is here today thinking of all of you and uh, those eight years with Bill and his love for Christ just I mean he just radiated it in our room and uh, about every day I see him sitting in a chair praising God saying Patty get your Bible out <laughs> get ready uh, just Thank you for sharing your dad and your, and everything about him, and we'll we'll miss him greatly. All right, Mike, you ready? Yeah, the more the merrier. Come on up. Hey guys, I'm Sean. Can everybody hear me okay? Uh, <clears throat> Grandpa Bill was my grandfather. Uh, I just wanted to tell the quick story of he used to, him and Grandma Carla used to pinch my cheeks and uh, <laughs> they would look me straight in the eyes and call me uh, the map of Sicily. And you know, I was, I was probably this big and I was like, I don't know what that really means, but sounds good. Um, and you know, now that I'm a little bit older, I, uh, <clears throat> I really cherish that feeling. Um, and I wish that I could tell my grandpa Bill that, oh, I'm sorry guys, I'm getting choked up, but, uh, that I see him as a map, um, but just more so of, <laughs> of life. And uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I'm sorry guys. I, 
just see him as a, as a map of life, and I want to be just like him. Uh, and I want to marry the love of my life, just like he did. And I want to have <laughs> faith, just like he did. Thank you, guys. I'm sorry. Thank you, everybody, for being here today. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, whether it's from Virginia, uh, California, Oregon, I, I appreciate everybody being here. Uh, thank you. So we all are here because we knew Bill. We knew that he was kind. He had an infectious smile. He was warm. But I thought the best way to honor and celebrate my father Today was to share with you a special experience that I had in my life with just him and I when I first realized that he became a father to me. That it, he really, I realized he didn't have to be. And uh, thank you for the guidance, Kyle, on that. And Aaron, too. Thank you, Aaron. Um, I was in my early 20s at the time and living with my mother, Carla, and my stepfather, Bill, in Southern California, and I was literally just a few days away from leaving the home and starting my new life away up in Northern California as a full-time college student. I was planning on taking the long two-day drive up north by myself, that is until my stepdad surprised me by asking if I would like some company on my long trip up to college. I couldn't believe it that he was really considering coming along with me as I always recall him and which was spoken here today as being very loyal and dedicated to his work, especially at that time in his life. It was no small thing for him to take time off work, especially for something like this, but he did because it mattered. With his choice to want to be a part of my important trip made me feel like I mattered. And that was important to me in my life was just as equally as important to him in his life. So needless to say, our journey up north ended up together, ended up being a very special experience for me. We laughed a lot. We told many stories uh, and got to really know each other each other and understand each other on a whole new level. It was just a wonderful trip that I will always treasure, cherish, and hold near and dear to my heart. Simply put, Bill ended up being the father figure in my life that he didn't have to be. <clears throat> and this special trip together only solidified this. Bill's act of selfless love and kindness to me at that critical time in my life forever changed me. I didn't know it at the time, but the positive seed and example that he left within me helped shape me into the father that I am today. So, Pop, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for being the outstanding father in my life and your grandchildren's life that you didn't have to be. I love you. And I hope that you're in that tree house with your beloved Carla Mary and enjoying your, your sweet life uh, again, reunited with her. I love you, Dad. going to pay our attention to the screens. We've got a fun video to watch and remember Bill by, so if you would. <laughs>
a bushel and a peck. You bet your pretty neck I do. A bushel and a peck, a bushel and a peck. Though you make my heart a wreck, make my heart a wreck, and you make my life a mess, make my life a mess. Yes, a mess of happiness about you, about you. 'Cause I love you, a bushel and a peck. You bet your pretty neck I do.
them up a little bit, make them look a bit, you know, make them look a little more fun. But the colors are significant. Um, we actually opened 
a, a second church over in Pesca Valley called Park Collective, and, and these are the colors that represent the, the, the park's logo, right? And um, actually, another story about the park before I get into this. Uh, I was talking to Gary, one of our safety team guys, and he was telling me about, he had a memory of Bill. Right when the park opened, if you've never been there, it, we, it's, an, it's a community center, and there's this indoor park that we have open to the community. And, and right after we opened, we, have, uh, we had this moment where Bill and I were in the back over by the zip line. And so there's a literal zip line that goes through the park, and people are gathering around. We're all just having fun. And, and Bill goes, I want to ride that. Uh, this was just a couple years ago, and everybody's like, I don't think because of church liability, this is a wise idea, but sure enough, um, I helped him up on the zip line, and I pushed him on the zip line, and he just was leaning back, smiling, laughing, and everybody was like, oh my gosh, it turned out okay, he ended up getting off the zip line, he survived, but that's the park, and, and I remember wearing these um, one Sunday, I was hosting here, and we were just out in the lobby, and Bill walks in, he goes, what are those? And I'm like, what? He said, those shoes are, and he's just light, he lights up about it. He just loved them. He couldn't believe it. And I go, Bill, I don't know, Bill. They're just my sneakers. I, they don't seem anything special. And he just absolutely loved them. And, and, and actually, you can see, there's his old shoes right there. He goes, will you trade me? <laughs> and I said, I don't, well, Bill, what size do you wear? He's like, about a 12. I'm like, well, I am a 12. And I go, but but I, those shoes are really worn out. I had no interest in his shoes. But for whatever reason, I had a pair of flip-flops that day. And so I was able to give him these shoes, and I wore flip-flops on stage and home. And I just loved how Bill, just, just the way he approached it, the way he took these. And then these became his church shoes. For his last about two years while he was here, he wore these every single weekend. And I'll tell you what, people took notice. They knew. They knew that's an, unusual, that's an unusual man to wear Air Force Ones. We actually, our worship team, um, uh, one of our worship leaders, Kaylee, came up with his nickname. His nickname around here was Soft Hands Bill. Because Bill would come up to you and shake your hand. But it wasn't just like a, a shake, you know. He would give you like that hugging kind of shake your hand. And Soft Hands Bill physically had soft hands, but it just matched the temperament of his soul. It was really cool. He was such an... Uh, just an amazing and unusual individual. Um, and I'm, I'm going to a, a, share something with you that I know he would be thrilled for me to share. It's uh, in a story that, well, we've heard a lot of stories today about Bill, um, but we're going we're gonna to hear in a little bit share a story out of the Bible, something that I know is just written in the walls of his heart. This is something that's very true to him. In my office, I've got this really cool poster I'm going to explain it to you, and, and your initial reaction to it is going to be like, that's really dark. I don't know why he has something like that, but I've got this poster in my office, and it is a grid of circles, all right? And the, sick, the circles go 52 across, and they go 87 down. So it's just this poster of blank circles. 52 across represents 52 weeks in a year, and 87 down represents 87 is, is the average year that an, an American male will live until they die. So this is a snapshot of your life. You've got a po I've got a poster in my, life, in my wall. I've been filling it in. You're supposed to fill in each circle as you go. And so I'm 38 now. I've got 38 of those 87 circles filled in. And the dark part is, is what are, like, who wants to be reminded of, like, oh, I've got, you know, I've only got this many years left. Um, that's not how I see it. I don't see it that way. Instead, I see it more like, look at how many I have left. I get to have these, these moments. I get to savor and enjoy every bit of my life. See, I'm filling these circles in week by week. But guess what? Only I am filling these circles in. Nobody else comes into my office and fills them in for me. Only I get to choose how I fill them in. Because those circles are significant. Every week that goes by, are you going to look back and be like, I just filled that circle with anger? I filled it with resentment. I filled it with selfishness, chasing whatever it is that I want. How do you want to fill those circles in? Is it like Bill? Bill, man, he, he filled those circles in with joy, kindness, happiness. He loved the people he was around. The relationships mattered so much to him. They mattered so much. 
And so you've got this poster that we all have. Like, how are we going to live our lives? There's a choice that we have to make. Really, it's all just, life is a whole bunch of choices, am I right? It's just a bunch of choices. That's really what it all comes down to. But there's one choice that you have to make that has much greater impact than all the others. Because here's a reality. Here's a reality. Life is short. Death is certain. And eternity is forever. Life is short. Death is certain. And eternity is forever. And there's a, there's a singular choice that you can make that will greatly impact eternity. And see, God had a choice. God sitting in heaven, legions of angels at his feet worshiping him. He had the choice to stay there. He could send his son down into this earth to live a life that's not so great. People were not so good to him. So why in the world would God depart heaven for us? So the story goes back a couple thousand years, and Jesus is this man who lived his life for other people. Everything about him was, how can I love somebody else? How can I serve someone else? How can I serve people? That was everything he was, love. And in his 30s, he gets arrested wrongfully, and he goes to trial. And he's in this courtyard, and Pontius Pilate is there, and, and, and there's probably a governor somewhere beyond him that's watching over this, and, and, and we've got Caiaphas, the Jewish elder, who, who is kind of over the religious side of, of the world right now, and, and so there's just this huge power struggle, and, and Pilate goes, all right, I have to decide what to do with Jesus. He's been arrested, and you all, because it's the day of festival, get to choose. Is he going to go free, or are we going to arrest him? Or are we going to crucify him? And so what he does is he puts up two people, and we're going to take a vote. This is what he does. He says, all right, we've got Jesus, the lover of men, the healer of healers, the greatest man that I've ever experienced in my life who does nothing but live his life for others. And we've got this other guy named Barabbas. And Barabbas here is for sure a murderer, a thief, and an insurrectionist. So that is his life. That is who he is. So you've got two different people who you get to set free. And Pilate goes, who do you want? All right, people, who do you want? And everybody says, Barabbas. We want Barabbas to go free, which makes no sense, right? Because Barabbas deserves a certain punishment, doesn't he? He deserves to be punished for the crimes that he committed. And Jesus, well, he hasn't done anything wrong. He doesn't deserve this, but you have to understand. It was Jesus who decided that outcome. It wasn't the people. Jesus said, I want Barabbas to go free because I'm going to pay the price for his sins. And so Jesus gets uh, arrested, and they try him, and they say, you are found guilty, and the punishment is going to be death. And so they, they put him on this road called the Via Dolorosa, and it's about three quarters of a mile long. And you got to understand, in Israel, all of those roads there were built out of limestone. So they weren't like these soft, rounded river stones that we had. They were like porous and sharp and, and really uncomfortable. And then they give him this huge cross. They put it on his back, crown of thorns, and, and they say, off you go. You're heading towards Golgotha. That's where you're going to go die. But you got to carry this, this cross so that everybody can see you and we can humiliate you. And this is the part of the story that I've always found so powerful. So Jesus here, innocent, has done everything for us. He's on, his road, on this road called Via Dolorosa, heading to his death. And you got to know that Jesus, the creator of the universe, has intense power. If he wanted to, just like that, we could send down angels to save him. He could stop it all. There's no reason for him to be doing this, but here he is. He's walking. Hey, good afternoon. This is Pastor Kyle. Um, I'm aware that we had some audio and video recording issues, and so I know the message kind of got cut off a little early, and so I just wanted to close things up so that you could hear the ending of this message and, and, and understand and hear where I was going. Um, but where I was, let's just pick up where I left off, and we were talking about Jesus being um, tortured and, and had to carry this cross across, um, through the, the Via Dolorosa. He was heading towards a place called Golgotha, 
Um, Golgotha is ultimately the location where he was crucified and, and murdered. Um, but this this road he's on is three quarters of a mile long, and and he's taking every single step, and every step he is is taking towards his certain death is so painful. And and I was talking about the limestone, and and I just can imagine having to carry that heavy cross after being tortured, the exhaustion you must feel. It's not like he was able to just skip down this road. He he certainly was collapsing down to his his knees because there's a point where Simon of Cyrene, there's a gentleman that they actually pull out of the audience to say, help him because he cannot physically do it himself. And so he's walking and he's, he's so exhausted that I, I just picture, I picture him having to make this decision of, you know, at any point he could have called those angels in heaven to come down and rescue him. He could have stopped it at any point. But for whatever reason, he kept going and he would take another step. And, and, and I have to believe that the reason why he took those steps was, was because in him, he had this, this thought that someday, someday he was going to have a relationship with Bill that was worth dying for. He knew that someday that, that there was going to be a man named Bill who would live his life for his father's kingdom. I had to believe that someday Jesus knew, Jesus knew that someday there was going to be a man named Kyle, my, that, that, that me, that little old me, that I, I was worth the torture he was going through, that you, that you were worth it, that the life that you're living, the choices that you make today really matter. Because God's after our souls. He's after eternity. He wants, he wants to spend eternity with us. And so Jesus is taking these steps of, of torture and pain because he knew that this had to happen. We look in the book of Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah was a prophet. 700 years before this event happened, there was a man who said, yes, Jesus is going to come. He's going to die, but he's going to resurrect three days later. 700 years before, there was a prophecy that Jesus was going to do this. And Jesus said, I am who I say I am. He, he, he wanted to be the, he wanted you to know that the promises he made, he was going to hold true to. And we see it again in, in Psalm 16. That's 1400 years before this event. They prophesy that Jesus was going to die for us and that he would be resurrected three days later because Jesus is who he says he is. And so that we, we know that there's a moment in the book of John, um, if you look in both chapters 16 and 20 and again back in 14, um, there's this sweet story that, that points to this fact that, that Jesus is going to resurrect, that he's going to have victory over death. And so we go back. We, I've been talking about this. You have to make a choice. That, that life is full of choices. And Jesus says in, in, in John 16, 33, Jesus says that I am the one who provides peace. And if you want that peace, there's a real simple way to have it. And it boils down to a choice. In my life, I found that it's super hard to hear the voice of God. It's hard to, to know when God is speaking and, and when the world is speaking. But in the book of uh, First Kings, we, we hear this story from, the, from a man, a prophet named Elijah, who's just at a point in life where he knows he needs to, he needs to hear from God. So Elijah says, I'm going to go into the wilderness and I'm going to listen to God. He goes out of the wilderness and, and something amazing happens. The first thing that happens is a huge windstorm rolls through. Big, loud, it just it's this enormous wind, windstorm rolls through. And, and Elijah goes, no, I couldn't hear God in that. And then there was a, a big earthquake. And in that earthquake, Elijah says, no, God, God, your voice is not in this earthquake. And then there's this, this fire that rolls through the valley that he's in. And, and in the fire, even in the fire, Elijah goes, no, God's voice is not in this. But then there's this real sweet moment where Elijah says it gets intimately quiet. It gets very silent. And Elijah goes, oh, there he is. I can hear you now, God. 
God speaks in the whispers of the wind. If you want to talk to him because you're ready to make a decision for him, you have to get quiet. You have to block out the noises of the world. You even need to block out your own thoughts. You need to get quiet. You need to listen because God will speak. And if you're ready to invite him into your life, because you have that choice, I just challenge you to get quiet. Because remember, life is short. Death is certain and eternity, eternity is forever. And the choices you make today have a huge, huge impact on eternity.